Hi everyone, Pastor Jake here. It's so good to be together again for worship here at Carlisle UMC. As we come into worship today at this historic and eventful moment in our history as a church, I want to share a few things with you. As we prepare to move to our new campus on Spring Garden Street, first of all, a big thank you to everyone who helped out with our closing services here at West Street in this last week, the pianists and the readers. It was a very meaningful time of remembering God's faithfulness to us here at this place on West Street and to remember God's continued faithfulness as we move. Also a reminder that this week coming up is our move week as a church, meaning the offices and all the contents will be moving from West Street to Spring Garden. That means the offices will be closed. If you need to get a hold of the pastors for an emergency, please use our cell phones. There will be a few days in the middle of the week when even our phones um, at the church are down. Um, so if you need to get a hold of anyone and you email folks, just be aware that it may, take, uh, it may take some time for you to get a response. Also, a reminder that as we do this move, we are in the middle of our Moving in Faith campaign, both our capital campaign and our sermon series today. A reminder that every week we're releasing new videos, uh, giving you a sneak peek of different parts of the building, so pay attention to our website, Facebook, and our Midweek Minute for those. Also, I hope you're praying along with the prayer, Lord, what do you want to do through me with our daily devotionals written by folks in the congregation. Also, as we move towards our first weekend there on September 20th, that Sunday, September 20th, I want to let you know that we will have a new worship schedule beginning on that Sunday. That is our commitment Sunday for our campaign and also our first Sunday where our new space will officially be open. And for that weekend, we will continue with this online worship. We will also have two indoor worship services at 8 and 11 that require sign up ahead of time. Sign ups go live on Tuesday, September 8th and then an outdoor worship service at 9.30. So our worship schedule will be 8 o'clock indoor with signups required, 9.30 outdoor, no signups required, and then 11 o'clock indoor worship service along with our online options. I can't wait for all the new worship opportunities that our new campus is going to afford to us, and I can't wait to see what God does in the days, weeks, and months, and years ahead. Well, we, can, we begin today our worship service as we continue to move in faith together. Pastor Mira is going to share the sermon today as she shares about the power of serving our community together. And so as we come into worship today, I want you, would invite you to join me in an opening prayer. Let us pray. Teach us, good Lord, to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for reward, except that of knowing that we do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue in worship, we continue with this special music from Connie, Sound the Battle Cry. Thank you. 
Well, today we want to spend some time in worship praying for ourselves and for our world. And as we do, just a few things to be in prayer for here as part of our church family. Uh, recovering from surgery this week is Don Sheps and Doris Harper. And then we also remember in sympathy Ken Hauser and his family at the death of his sister Lois. As we uh, go into a time of prayer, let us center ourselves and open ourselves to God's presence as we listen to this music. God, we come before you today. We come together as your people, your people who are open to your spirit and to your presence. And as we come together, God, we come to pray for our needs and for the needs of our community and for the world. God, we pray for the people of this congregation. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery, that they would be healed and that they would come to fullness of health. And we pray for all others who are going through struggles or difficulties, that you would be their healing and their hope. We pray for Ken Hauser and his family as they mourn the death of his sister Lois, along with all others who mourn this day. God, we also continue to pray for the concerns of this community. As families go back to school, we pray for students and for parents for parents, we pray that as they manage all of the details of this school year, that you would be with them, that you would give them peace and clarity. And God, we pray that you would give them assurance that they are doing great and that what they are doing is enough. For students, God, as they adjust to the new school year, we pray that the adjustment may go well. We pray that they may find joy and connection and learning this year, even in the new rhythms that we find ourselves in. And God, we pray for our community. 
We pray for those places of hurt and of brokenness. We pray for those who are struggling with isolation or with mental health because of all that is going on. And we pray, God, that you may show us how to be your hands and feet, how to reach out and care for our neighbors in this time of need. And God, we pray for our world. God, we pray this day that as we are your hands and feet, that you would show us what it means to be your people who reach out and care and concern. We pray for peace where there is conflict. We pray for hope where there is despair. God, we pray for, uh, we pray for direction and guidance. And God, we pray that in all things that you might continue to bless us to be salt and light in the world. God, for all these things, we pray to you this day as we remember the prayer that, our, that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi kids, I'm Pastor Mira, and thanks for joining us today. Today, with the adults in a little bit, I'm gonna talk about what it means to love our neighbors. Well, in the Bible, there was a story about Jesus one day in the temple, which it was what they called church then. He was in the temple and the religious leaders all said to him, hey Jesus, what's the most important thing for us to know and for us to do? And Jesus replied with this. He said, the most important thing is this, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. There are so many ways that we can do that, that we can love God, right? We read scripture, we read our Bibles, we say our prayers. We give thanks to God for everything that God has given us. Those are all some really great ideas and ways that we can love God. But you know what Jesus said next? He said that we also must love our neighbors. Well, how do you think you can love your neighbor? There's lots of different ways we can do this too, right? Some of you may make cookies for your neighbors. I know we're doing that this week because we had a new neighbor move into my, into my neighborhood. But you can also love your neighbors by holding doors open for them or making them smile, making cards for them. We also like to draw chalk art on other neighbors' driveways that we know well and that makes and brings a smile to their face. But there are so many ways that we can love our neighbors and that we can love God. And those are the commandments. Those are the rules that Jesus said was, were most important, that we need to do both of them, that we need to love God and we need to love our neighbors. So this year, as you begin school, I hope you remember those two things that are super important. And each and every day, you look for ways that you can love God and also ways that you can love your neighbors because you love God and because you know God. And Jesus said, to live like me, this is what you need to do. I invite you now to bow your heads. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for all the kids in our congregation and in our community. We ask that you would be with them and help them as they go about every day in their lives, as they go to school, as they play together, Lord, help them to love you through their prayers, through how they treat one another, and through the stories in the Bible that help them to be like Jesus. Help them also to love their neighbors, to reach out and help, and to make others smile. For God, when we do this, it shows that we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, kids, for joining us for worship today. I hope you have a great week. Today's scripture comes from the New Testament and Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth. This is Paul's most personal letter with a clear theme that the lives of Christians cannot be separate from the message of Christ they proclaim. Hear now this scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 7 and 12 through 15. Paul writes, we want you to know, brothers and sisters, 
about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected, they gave themselves first to the Lord, and by the will of God to us, so that we might urge Titus that, as he has already made a beginning, he should also complete this generous undertaking among you. Now, as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm Pastor Mira. Thanks for joining us again in worship today. And today we continue with our Moving in Faith series during our second capital campaign. You know, last year when we picked the title for this capital campaign, our world looked so different. When we were thinking that we'd be in our new church by the summer, when we didn't know that Pastor Jim was thinking of retiring and Pastor Jake would be joining us, what seems like ages ago, this title, Moving in Faith, really stood out to our leadership team because as we read the hundreds of suggestions from other churches, we knew that this campaign would be more than just moving locations, but also, and maybe more importantly, an opportunity for us to move forward and to do ministry in new and unique ways. It's about taking ministry, not just taking it from what we did downtown and transplanting it into our new location, but that we, to continue to grow as a church and to be vital, we would need to follow God's vision and mission for our church, and that moving meant not just moving our stuff in boxes, but moving in faith. It's about evaluating the mission and the ministries that we're currently doing and asking and keeping only what's essential but also creating new ministries as we use this new space as a launching pad for ministry of 2020 and far beyond. So what's that really mean, you ask? What's our ministry look like as we move in faith? Well, before we go there, I wanna look at the scripture you heard this morning. You heard from 2 Corinthians. It began as a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to churches in Corinth, really focusing on their pastoral and real life issues the people were facing. In the Bible introduction, in my Bible, it says this, it says, here the honeymoon is definitely over. Paul has been told his letters are strong. You know, I think that's one of the reasons I really like Paul's letters. They are bold, they are forward, and you have no doubt what he's telling the churches. So with these letters, Paul sends James, Caiaphas, and John out as they agree to go and share these letters. And this one was meant for the church in Corinth. You know, in chapter eight, Paul begins by boasting about the generosity of the Macedonian churches. He writes that during severe challenge, with abundant joy, even in extreme poverty, the church in Macedonia, they were still able and committed to giving generously to their community. You know, during our first capital campaign, there were many in our congregation who were living on a fixed income and have very little spending income available beyond their daily expenses. And yet, 
We heard story after story from those of you in our church about how you were giving $10 a week or $5 a week, and we understood that that was a huge sacrifice in your life. You were living differently because you wanted to be generous. You know, last campaign, these stories of faithfulness brought alive for me the words that our consultant said and that consultants use, equal sacrifice, but not equal gifts. In verse three of our scripture, Paul puts it this way. Paul says, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in the ministry to all the saints. You know, I understand that scripture in a new way because of you in this congregation, because you're living out what Paul said about that Macedonian church, because of how I saw your faithfulness to build this new church building for our community as you gave through our last capital campaign. Now, I want us to remember, though, that Paul wasn't writing to the Macedonians He was writing to the Corinthians because he was pointing out, hey, here's your neighbor that has this strength that in this other community is doing really, really well because the Corinthians were really a well-off church. And Paul says, just as you excel in your faith, as you excel in your speech and knowledge, as you are eager and as you love so generously, also too, make sure you are giving generously. Their generosity was to match the great faith and wisdom and knowledge and love that Paul saw and Paul heard about from the churches in Corinth. It was back in 2012 when we were unifying as a congregation and I was asked to work with the mission leaders of all three of our churches and develop and create what the serve pillar would look like. I read the book Missional Renaissance by Reggie Miller to really help clarify how we would build our serve pillar. And Miller challenged his church leaders. He said, ask your mission teams what difference it makes if they serve in your community as a part of the church or if they serve in the community as part of the Kiwanis or another community group. So one evening I did just that. I asked, as we were looking at all of our mission partners, I asked that question. And the answer was a bit of silence. And it made me realize more recently how far we've come since that evening in 2012. Miller said that it was critical that every person that served from your church and every person in our congregation understood and knows how they're different if they serve with Carlisle United Methodist Church versus if they're serving with the Kiwanis or Boy or Girl Scouts, all of which, certainly not bad organizations, but why we serve is different. As a church, we serve because we want to show a response to God's love in our life. It's not about service hours, although those teach our kids good things, and it's not about being a good person, although good people serve the hungry. It's about our response. It's our response to Jesus' love and the blessing of love in our life that we can reach out and bless others. If my service and my love to others is a response of my overflowing love of Christ in my life, then Jesus' love within me doesn't run dry. I don't get discouraged when serving is hard, but I live better. I love better, and I serve those in our community better. I'm inspired to live like Jesus, not just to be a good neighbor. And that's been an intentional shift in our serve ministries here at CUMC. We serve because Jesus is in our lives. And we need to remember that that's the core of why we go out and care for our neighbors and why we reach into the community with all of the partners we have in mission and ministry. So are you serving your neighbor to be a good person or because you want to live like Jesus and let the love of Jesus overflow in your life? Because if the well of Jesus is overflowing in your life, The simple acts of serving at Salvation Army also include prayers, both spoken and unspoken.
When you tutor kids in Carlisle, when we carry rocks in Haiti, when we feed the farm workers, we are changed when we serve with the intent to live like Jesus because we care for our neighbors from a place of our faith and because we want them to feel the love of Christ. So who are our new neighbors as we move into this church on South Spring Garden Street? Past couple weeks to learn a little more about our neighbors, I looked who is within one mile of our new church home. Our current neighbors are an average age of 39, making this neighborhood significantly younger than Carlisle Borough. However, our neighbors over the age of 65 will be increasing by 4% over the next 10 years. 42% of our new neighbors live alone and 48% live with other family members. 10% live with no family members. So looking at it another way, there are 65% of our new neighbors who are single for lots of different reasons, but who are single and living within a mile of our new church. What an opportunity we have to be a place and a space where those in this community can find community and can find fellowship. Most of our neighbors have cars. 59% of them are, were employed as of the end of 2019. 26 of them travel less than 15 minutes to their jobs, but 37% of them travel over 30 minutes to their jobs. And while most of our neighbors have incomes over 50,000, there's also 17% of those right in our backyard who are living below the poverty line. 80% of our new neighbors are white, but the greatest increase in diversity in this neighborhood comes from those of Pacific American and Indian American races. And while we have already met neighbors who speak Spanish, there's about 3%. In this community, there is the greatest rise in people, over 1.5% and more coming are speaking Arabic. Socially and morally, it's a community that believes in the importance of peace, and the well-being of all their neighbors. Our neighbors are concerned about race relations and are weighed down by financial concerns. It's a neighborhood that agrees that God is love, but many do not have a personal relationship with Christ. And many see religious people as too judgmental and they don't trust any organized religion. So what would it be like? What will it be like to be a church in this community? What are they looking for for a church if they were even to come in the doors? The number one answer was a warm and friendly congregation. They're looking for social activities and opportunities to volunteer in their community. Now this is where I think CUMC can excel and we are ready to be that church in this community. I'm so proud of you each time that I hear from our guests that they experience people at CUMC that are warm and friendly. From the first time they check out our website to when they ask questions or even when they come to drive in worship, even with your masks on, they experience your warmness and friendliness and it shines through. I believe that that's Jesus shining through you. It's not just that we're a church of great people, but that you are ready and willing to let Jesus shine through you in how you welcome one another, in how you greet those who you might not know their name, but you're willing to reach out and say hello. And that's what our neighborhood is looking for. You know, just like the Apostle John, poverty is not solely determined by income or food insecurity. Poverty can also be in the need for a relationship, in a longing for hope or a deep desire to have answers in our lives, questions that we've been struggling with to find those answers. Here at CUMC, we have the potential to change the lives of our neighbors. We have the potential to be new neighbors who can provide that, those answers to hope those relationships to join together in life together with those right here in our backyard. 
And we're also strongly positioned to offer opportunities to get involved and serve as a part of CUMC reaching out into our community. When the vision team of Serve talked about opportunities and possibilities that we could grow into with this new building, we want to provide deeper learning and opportunities to understand poverty and mental health of our community better. Serve's interested in partnering again with our grow classes and our connect groups to get everyone at least once a year doing a Serve project and meeting needs of our community partners in new and deeper ways. We're also looking to develop a new team and opportunities to partner with Project Share. This summer, they have been reaching 450 kids in their feeding program. And there's great opportunity there for us to join in with them and do some new and exciting things they're thinking and planning. You know, this week, as some of our leaders were talking, one of them mentioned that what she was so impressed with was CUMC when they first came to the church about seven years ago, is that they really felt that they had found their church home when CUMC made the decision to give away a tithe of the $1 million donation that we received. The leader said that to her and her family, that was a sign that as a congregation, we were committed to bettering our neighborhood and to helping our neighbors in need. You see, moving towards our neighbors requires more than just giving our time or our energy or our finances. It requires our hearts. It requires our ears. And it requires our hands. You know, what I've discovered through working and living with this text the past two weeks that I really had never realized before, that unlike many stories in Scripture, we often hear about blessing or helping others that this story, Paul was writing not just to an individual about how to reach out to your community, but Paul was reaching out and telling the church that as a church, this is your responsibility as well. That our church should be focused on our neighbors and focused on our community. And I'm so proud that CUMC has made that a core bedrock and belief of who we are as a congregation. Paul was inspired. He was inspired by those Macedonian churches and their commitment to those in need. But he also said this in verse five, you heard these words from John. He said, they gave themselves first to the Lord and by the will of God to us. You know, last week, Pastor Jake talked about where God has guided us, God will provide. So are you willing to trust even now as we move into this new building, as we're doing a capital campaign without large worship, worship services, and we're still scattered under many roofs for worship, some of them homes, some of them cars. Are we willing to pray that prayer, Lord, what do you want to do through me? And to truly, truly listen. Are you listening with ears about how much to give to make a difference through the ministries of our church that can be launched from this space? Ministries that can be launched into this new neighborhood and into the lives of children and students and adults who are looking for fellowship, who are looking for hope, and who have the potential to be transformed, just like we have been, by the love of Christ. I truly believe that the Macedonian church, that they likely heard similar words and prayed similar prayers, like, Lord, what do you want to do through us? And their response, despite their hardships, despite tight funds, and despite trying times, their response was one that changed the lives of those in their own community and one that Paul wrote about, and 2,000 years later, we're still reading about their response to give generously. And we have that opportunity as well. I pray that how you respond to our campaign prayer is one that is told for generations. Generosity that becomes a launching pad for ministry to our neighbors and our community that can change forever 
the greater Carlisle community and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of our church at this point and for your commitment as a church to reach out to our neighbors in need. For there's a, it's a great time to be a part of CUMC. I invite you to bow your heads. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the privilege that we have to share in ministry to those in and beyond our neighborhood. Still our minds, open our hearts to hear your guidance and to love our neighbors just like the Macedonian church did in their time. For you are God of this city and greater things are yet to be done. Use us, we pray. Amen. Thank you.
It's so good to be together in worship today. And as we come towards the end of the service, I just want to remind you of what an incredible gift it is to be part of a community of faith, to be part of a church that's making a deep impact in individual lives and in the life of our community and our world. As we prepared for this Moving in Faith campaign, we collected from folks in the congregation uh, answers to the question, what does Carlisle UMC, CUMC mean to me? And here are some of those answers that reflect what it means to make a difference in people's lives. Christine, age 31, said, CUMC means to me having a community in Carlisle and a place to raise my children in faith. Melissa, age 42, says, CUMC means a place of grace and healing and fellowship with fellow believers. Joe, age 67, says, CUMC means to me learning more and more. <laughs> learning never stops when you're following after Jesus. Sophia, who's age 15, says, it means a place to come together and praise God and to share the talents that God gave me. One other, uh, Peter, age 87, says it means to me family. And Mary, age 71, says it means a place of peacefulness of mind that brings me closer to our Lord. And then just two others. One person said anonymously, CUMC for me is a place to restore my faith. And Madison, age 8, says it means that I can pray to God whenever I want these are just little pieces of the kind of impact that together God is having through us as part of Carlisle UMC. It's why it's so important, and I hope that you are praying the prayer that's on the back of the detail brochure that you should have received this week as part of the Moving in Faith campaign, this prayer, Lord, what do you want to do through me? Because I truly believe that it is one of the greatest privileges of any of our lives to be part of a community that's making such deep impact in the lives of others and in our community. And I believe how we pray that prayer and answer that question together, today, tomorrow, and in the years to come, will have an impact that is beyond anything that we even can see today. So thank you, CUMC. Thank you for your faithfulness, thank you for your giving, and thank you for your commitment as we move towards Commitment Sunday on sub Sunday, September 20th, to pray the prayer, Lord, what do you want to do through me? And be open to whatever God calls you to. Here's Pastor Mira to end with our closing benediction. As we close out worship today, I want to say thank you that you joined us online for worship. Also, two quick reminders. The first is if you would like to join us in worship on September 20th for in person, we ask that you sign up online and we look forward to that day to celebrating together in our new building, whether you're able to join us in person, whether you're able to join us in the parking lot, or whether you're going to be able online to see our new worship center that day. We are so excited as we move towards that day. Also, a reminder that our church offices are closed this upcoming week. We are moving so many boxes, so much stuff is going to migrate over to the new building. And so if you need us or have a pastoral emergency, please call the pastor's cell phones. We'll do our best to respond to you as quickly as possible. And now this week, may you go. May you love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And may your love of God spill out of your life into your neighbor's. And may you love your neighbors as you live like Jesus. Go in peace. Amen.